I've seen so many people um, start this and then give up within three, four videos and then they don't do any more. Stick to it. You know, don't worry about the fact that you don't have many views, you don't have many subscribers. If you consistently do this, it will come. I can promise you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are and wherever you're watching from. I'm Matt Pierce, host of the Visual Lounge, the place where we talk about using visuals and videos and images and all that good stuff for the workplace. So today, our guest is Paul Wilson, and we're gonna be talking to Paul about his journey creating screencasts and moving into the world of YouTube and what that's like and all the things that he has that he can share with us to help us make better videos. So with that said, let's get started by introducing Paul. Paul has been an instructional designer working with the corporate sector since 2005. After 10 years, Paul decided to start his own e-learning design company. To help promote his business, Paul began to create Adobe Captivate video tutorials on YouTube. We'll link to that in our show notes, by the way. These videos were used to attract potential clients looking for a skilled e-learning designer. This strategy proved successful as he's worked with clients from all over the globe, helping them build highly engaging e-learning solutions. Paul's YouTube channel presented an additional benefit of attracting aspiring Captivate developers to seek him out as a mentor and a teacher. As of 2022, Paul's YouTube channel has over 3 million views and over 22,000 subscribers on his way to 23. Hopefully, we'll help him push over that. Paul offers both online and on-site training on Adobe Captivate. With that said, welcome Paul Wilson to the Visual Lounge. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Matt. Looking forward to sharing some insights here and uh, been looking forward to, to getting back together with you and, and, and just having a good chat. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. We're, we're so glad that you're here. And it's, you know, I know we've, we've tried to connect a couple times along the way and I'm glad it's finally working out. Um, we're mm-hmm. going to get, we're going to dive into our questions and I, I'm really excited I want to get through our first three questions so we can get to all the other stuff because I know you just have yep. some great insights. So first question that we ask, how did you get involved with using, I'm thinking like screen videos, as part, you know, you've, you've gone through this transition using screen videos as kind of corporate, I'm guessing, into like, I mean, how did you get started with all this stuff? Because it seems like you've come a long way. It, it was a happy accident, actually. My, my manager at my last job that I worked as an employee before I went uh, freelance on my own, uh, asked me to take on a project where we were teaching people how to use some software. And uh, obviously, I'm an Adobe Captivate e-learning designer developer. So it has its ability to uh, to do what they call video demos. Um, and uh, so I did some experiment. I really hadn't done very much of that. I did some experiments with that tool. And to do this, I used two instances of Captivate. I had one Captivate uh, session running on one monitor and another where I would actually do the demos. I didn't know the new software that we were teaching yet. So I just did some uh, demo tutorials of what Adobe Captivate could do. And uh, when I was done, we proceeded with that project, but I had these recordings that I'd made and I thought, well, what the heck, I'll just throw them up on YouTube. And so as happy accidents sometimes uh, occur when you do stuff like this, suddenly people started to watch these videos and some people started to subscribe. And and, uh, I thought, well, what what a great opportunity to share my knowledge. So I started recording more and more videos without really an intention of growing a huge YouTube channel. But uh, as I said, it was a happy accident because it just kind of blew up. And and uh, when I eventually decided to go freelance, I thought, well, I'll just keep doing this and try to attract some attention around me. And you know, if you're looking for someone to build similar type training for your organization, or if you want to learn how to do this, you can reach out to me. So it kind of blew up in my face, really, <laughs> in a good way. Well, I, I I love that because I think that's one of the great things about the the world we live in is those can happen, and you know you have you have some key knowledge you can easily share it. So my my next question for you here, Paul, is how do you define success? And and I have really two things I'm I'm curious about here. How do you how do you define success for being on YouTube, and then just generally for your videos? 
Well, there's the obvious thing, like when you obviously put out a video and many people watch it. I mean, that's the obvious success. Um, but I'm not just a YouTuber. Obviously, I'm a working e-learning designer developer. I'm I'm doing teaching for, for individuals. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one teaching for those that maybe don't want to stick to a, a full Captivate curriculum, but they want to learn one thing about the software. Uh, when people reach out to me, to me, that's success because, uh, you know, the end goal for me is to, you know, to build my, uh, my clientele to such a point where, you know, maybe I don't need to use YouTube anymore, but, you know, it's really, it's, uh, YouTube is almost like my business card. And when the business comes back to me, when I get the, uh, you know, the end result of someone reaching out to me and hiring me for a much bigger project because of some of some or or one of my videos that they've seen um, that's really success uh, the ad revenue from YouTube's nice as well I don't want to downplay that because that uh, does represent a pretty sizable chunk of my my income I used to say uh, when people would ask me how much money do you make from YouTube I'd say oh it's just pizza money that was my expression uh, but it's actually grown to a point where it's, I can't say that anymore, unless I'm eating pizza three, three meals a day for <laughs> months at a time, but <laughs> it's more than that now. But, you know, certainly, um, the, the second tier of what it is that I do, where people reach out to me and, and hire me for bigger projects, that's success to me is that, you know, the, the YouTube video has, uh, achieved what I hoped it would do. So. I, well, I love that. I love that it's uh, it's be able to do those two things, right? Because I think yeah. <laughs> it's a lot like writing a book. When, when I, I having not write, written a book, I can't say this for myself, but like I know a lot of people that have, and it, it becomes mm -hmm. a business card. It becomes a thing to say, like, "Hey, look at me! I I really am good at this." And so I yeah. I love that's a that's one of the definitions because it, it's an enabler, and I think that's a something maybe we don't often think about with, uh, you know, from an instructional design standpoint, how videos can enable us to go on and do maybe other things. So that's mm -hmm. great. Okay. Third question for you, more broad. What's a tip that you could give us to help our audience to improve using videos in their work? So what's something that you've learned that you could, you could share with us? I think the, the best thing I learned along the way or the most effective thing I learned along the way, because I, I would sometimes I'd receive requests from people like, uh, I want to create this e-learning course, then it does A, B, C, and D. And then if I do B, it's going to jump over to C. And then, you know, this complicated reinventing of e-learning. And I would make that video. Um, it ultimately, as you can imagine, wasn't very effective because really that video was for one person. And I think if you if you pick a topic, like if you're going to be teaching someone how to use a particular piece of software, do those videos on one topic within that software. And I find that that's effective because when people look for videos, whether it's on your learning management system or whether it's on YouTube, they're looking for a particular solution to a problem. So rather than trying to take on the whole thing all at once, Pick one aspect of, of what you want to teach, what you want to show, and uh, make your video about that. Yeah, I love that. I, and it's such good advice that one thing, right? A video can do one thing. Don't do 12 things. Just focus on the right. one thing. So, yeah. well, Paul, so far, I, I awesome answers uh, to our questions. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Ryan Knott, and I'm a marketing content specialist here at TechSmith. I love Snagit for so many reasons, but probably most importantly, for how it allows me to quickly share complex information in an easy to understand way. In my role, I often have to share a lot of SEO data. And with Snagit, I can grab a quick screenshot of analytics data, highlight the things I want people to notice, and add any context or commentary I need to with Snagit's easy callouts. Then I can drag that image into Slack or a bunch of other communication tools. Or I can even pull together a quick video talking through the data or other information I need to share. It's way easier than email and provides so much more value to the viewer. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to the Visual Lounge Podcast. All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm here with Paul Wilson, and we are talking about his growth from 
e-learning designer to continuing to be an e-learning designer to YouTube. So, so Paul, you mentioned that you, you made a Captivate tutorial with Captivate. Uh, is that your first screencasting tutorial that you ever made then? Yeah. Um, I, that was, I really, uh, I, you know, it was one of those things where you use the tools that you have. Uh, Adobe Captivate has um, a couple of um, software capture type tools, but video demo built into it is, uh, you know, it was pretty effective for uh, 2010 or whatever it was, but I've changed over the years. Like what I've done is I started with that. They have another product that they actually, once I started to become a little famous in the uh, <laughs> the uh, Captivate space, uh, they, they sent me a copy of Adobe Presenter Video Express, which is now discontinued. And it was fine. I, I, it did an okay job. Some of my earlier videos are with that. But along the way, I discovered uh, Camtasia. And I just like, I can't look back now. That is my tool of choice for, uh, for recording any kind of stuff. It's so fast and easy and simple to use. And once you learn something, it's like riding a bike. You can just, uh, you know, I can knock out a YouTube video in an hour or two. Uh, it's just an excellent tool for that. I've tried all sorts, but it's it's definitely my tool of choice at this point. Well, thank you for saying that. We did not prompt you to say that, so but thank you. Nope. We, we appreciate that. So one of the questions I'm curious about, Paul, is as you've you, as you've gone through this journey, one of the things I think happens for a lot of us is when you're an e-learning designer, often you're internally focused on your business, right? Like mm -hmm. your your audience are coworkers or people who work at the same business. YouTube, on the other hand, is is a very different type of audience, right? They're outside your organization. You maybe don't do or don't know who they are. Um, how, how do you adjust what you're creating when you're looking at that? So are there things that you do inherently different for like if you're making a video for internal versus external or are you kind of using the same approaches? Most of it's the same, I would say, but one, one of the things that are different or is different rather, um, I think when, when learners come to YouTube, they're coming to YouTube with, um, um, you know, a motivation to learn something. Whereas internally within a corporation, that's not always the case. So you have to work really hard to make your content uh, when you work within a, a corporate environment to make it more engaging for those internal people. You know, you really need the what's in it for you aspect. You know, when I design training, we often talk about with them, what's in it for, for me. And, um, you know, you need that, you know, this is why this training is important to you. Uh, with YouTube, however, there isn't a lot of time to go into that kind of stuff. I, mm -hmm. I do like to provide a little bit of context as to why this tutorial exists, but um, you know, usually I don't need to sell the YouTube audience on why they should take this video and watch it to completion uh, because they've come looking for it. They've searched it out. Whereas within the corporate environment, they're, they're often told, um, you know, you have to complete your compliance training. Uh, get that done before the end of the week or something like that. But with YouTube, it's a, it's more of a self-discovery type thing and people find the, the stuff that they're looking for. Yeah, I well, I love that, right? That uh, internal folks need the motivation. External folks are are intrinsically motivated, I guess. They they have a problem, they want to yeah. solve it so they're, or they're interested in that topic so they're going to look it out. Uh, so with that said, I'm curious about your process. One thing you just mentioned that you, you can you're obviously an expert. You can move through making these YouTube videos pretty quickly, but generally when you're making a piece of content, video content, what's your process look like? And again, not, we don't need to get nitty gritty necessarily, but start to finish. Is it like you have an idea and then you just run with it? Or are there like, what are the steps to get from idea to completed video? Well, yeah. So the, the first thing that I run into is, uh, you know, I need, I need an idea, like uh, unlike the corporate world where there's usually a request for this particular type of training, when you're working for yourself, it's kind of a blank slate. So when you're a YouTuber, it's just a blank slate. What do you, you know, how do you decide what videos to make? Um, you know, in, in my world, I just 
I just devour the internet. I just go out there. Um, user uh, forums is a great place. See what questions people are asking. See what things people are are having challenges with. You know, and and then when I find something, I think, oh, that would make a great YouTube video. The first thing I do is I kind of you know using the software that I'm teaching. In my case, Adobe Captivate. I will build whatever it is that you know they're asking me to build, or or they would like to have a solution for, and uh, make sure it works, of course. Mm -hmm. And through the uh, the magic of having dual monitors, I can literally have a completed version of that project on one monitor when I'm recording it and capturing it. So it's all planned out. It's all scripted. Um, if you try to wing it, uh, I find, you know, you, you end up having to edit out a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, because you'll make mistakes and, you know, this way you can plan it out, know exactly what every step is and, uh, and obviously make it effective for, for your learners as well, because if they, if they get confused by the steps, you know, because of, you know, oh, and well, by the way, I forgot to mention this earlier, you need to do this at step number two, that's not going to be very helpful to them. So knowing a not not quite so scripted out, but knowing exactly what the uh, what the outcome is beforehand uh, right. is hugely beneficial. Yeah, I would imagine, especially with like software tutorial training, that having the steps like, oh, I know these are the so you can just almost check check box them, right? Yep check that we did that we did that we did that because often i know as someone who's made those type of tutorials that it's so easy to get ahead of myself right like and oh yeah because yeah, I, I especially as an expert in the product so i i love that advice that you know plan it out i'm mm -hmm. i'm curious as you're as you're building these out um you know we have instructional designers e-learning designers design is in the title and so as you're planning these out, what, how do you balance out between like, this is what it is. I'm going to make it work versus I'm going to make it look good. Is that something that's in your kind of radar or are you much more uh, function kind of like, let's just get through the functions. We'll make how it looks is how it looks and we'll, we'll wrap up when it's done. But, uh, or do you worry about the, the look of your videos and the, the feel of your videos? No, I, I totally do. And, and in fact, early on, I didn't. Right. So again, uh, I'm the perfect person to ask because I've made all the mistakes. You know, I'll take that blank slide and I'll create a gray box and I'll do what it is, you know, that, that you're asking me to do with it uh, without thinking about design. But more recently, I would say within the last couple of years only, uh, and it's been about seven years that I've been doing YouTube videos. But in the last couple of years, I will take the time to demonstrate that you know what it doesn't have to be a white background with a gray box it can be something that looks really impressive you know like one of my videos that comes to mind was i was teaching people that you could use any shape for the answers in a multiple choice question and i went so far as to create a blue background as if we were looking at a map of the ocean and I was creating the outline shapes of different countries. So you had to select, you know, which countries were part of the UK, for example. I think that's what it was. And, uh, you know, I took the time to really build that out. I traced all these images and, and I built a slide that looked like it was ready to be published rather than just, you know, using uh, rectangles and triangles and circles, you know, which is what I could have done with that. but. I decided to make it uh, a little bit more real. And obviously I'm thinking too, from the perspective of someone who might hire me when they see that not only, you know, you've got a solution to this problem, but you have a solution that looks fantastic as well. I think that's important training. So often we hear in training um, and I've had conversations with many people about this, you know, the appearance of training doesn't matter as long as you get the concept. I disagree. I think that the appearance of your work is just as important. It contributes to the engagement from your learners. Um, but, you know, there's a professionalism that I think that sometimes the training uh, industry doesn't pay attention to. And I think they should. Uh, yeah, I, I am with you. And I think it's it's always that balance, right, of time and effort. Obviously, you need to know what's going to work for your audience. But I, I love that sure. example, thinking, thinking beyond like, yes, I want it to look good for my audience. But, you know, 
I don't know Captivate, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep this very high level. But like, okay, it can do a square, a circle, a star. But showing that you can do a yeah. country outline is very complex and maybe way more than I ever need. But to show that, that's that's very impactful, I think, from mm -hmm. an understanding standpoint. Um, kind of one other question about the way your videos look. I'm curious, as you are making these videos, you know, I, I feel like a lot of times videos have very repeatable elements, you know, whether it's the lower thirds or whether it's intros, outros. Are, are there things that you've templatized and said like, hey, I know I'm going to always kind of use these things or are you trying to always kind of refresh and make it new every single video? I try to make it a little fresh, but, you know, there obviously making YouTube videos is a means to an end for me. Um, it's growing and becoming more important to my business. But, you know, my goal is that the rest of the week, I want to spend time working with my clients, doing doing the other stuff that I do. I want this to take no more than a couple of hours of my time. So for me, I, I sort of follow um, a structure. So there's that that first 10 seconds where I say, in this video, you will learn about ABC, one, two, three, whatever it is. Then there's my, my title card, which is uh, a combination of annotations and effects and stuff like that. It's all templated out and I can drag and drop that into place uh, within a second or two, uh, you know, as I'm editing um, my video in Camtasia. And then I go on and do a, a longer explanation about what this video is about or, or what the inspiration for this video uh, uh, is or, you know, hey, I saw that Bob on the forums had this question. Here's a <laughs> screenshot. Um, and then on that is a lower third that's, again, templated out. It's Paul Wilson, e-learning designer developer. And then towards the end of that explanation, I have this animated bit that comes up reminding people to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And then from there, I'm in the tutorial. I stay focused in the tutorial. And in the last 20 seconds, I have another template. Again, I just pop it in there uh, with a little voiceover narration, um, you know, explaining what it is that I do, how you can get in touch with me. Please subscribe to the channel, all that stuff. A little bit of animation, a little bit of video in the background. So, you know, the, the time I spend on, on making, um, you know, making a YouTube video is, uh, is very planned out. And I can usually get, uh, you know, from, from an idea to a published video within a couple of hours. So thank God for templates. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, well, I'm thank you for that answer. And, you know, it's, I think that's one thing I've been learning, especially with a show like this and with other things I do is that those templates just, they're a lifesaver because once you have an, it takes time to put them in place, but once you have them in place is, you know, you can just move through the decisions that you have to make. So thank you for, I think that's a great answer. Now, one of the things that, you know, because we're talking about YouTube and you're, you're doing a lot on YouTube, the video is obviously the big piece, but there's other things that have to be there, which may not always apply to people who are focused internally. If they're in a learning management system or LMS, you know, titles, thumbnails. I, I think those things are always good and always important, whatever context, but I want to talk to you about your experiences with these because I think you said already that you've kind of, you've made all the mistakes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what would you, ha what would you have us learn about uh, in terms of titles? Because I think that's one thing that's, I've made the mistake of, of naming things poorly, uh, you know, not yep. meaningfully. So what, what have you learned, been able to learn about writing good titles for YouTube? I would say that probably the most important thing about writing a title is try to phrase the title using search terms. Like what is someone going to search for, right? You can say, for example, in e-learning, we talk about force navigation, right? That's the very formal word for hiding a next button until you've completed some activity. And then, of course, making it available so that your learners can continue from that point. Um, but you don't want to use forced navigation. That's not a phrase that you would put in your title. Uh, instead, you would might you might say something like "hide a next button until your learners have completed an activity." Mm -hmm. That might be a title for for the video. You know, put it in 
first of all, put it in normal human terms. Don't use, you know, jargon or, or slang or, or industry terms and things like that. Try to put it in normal language uh, and try to use the types of words that, uh, that people would actually use. So we talk about uh, search engine optimization. Um, I don't know if it's the first or the second, but YouTube is either the first or second um, search engine next to Google. So uh, there's tons of people that are, are searching for YouTube videos, not necessarily, but just searching on the internet and they come across YouTube videos. So I want to, I do a little, I spend a little time with the title thinking about what would someone type into a search engine that might lead them to this video. And those keywords are important. You can't use uh, anything that's going to take them, you know, or, or, or not allow your video to be found. So, uh, and sometimes a little A-B testing is worth doing as well. So I've done that in the past where for a period of time, I'll try one title. And then the following week, I'll do a different title. And then look at the numbers and see which one comes out on top. And that might be the one I choose. So... Uh, but yeah, you got to really think about it. It's probably the most important thing on a YouTube video is what it's called. I love that comment about SEO or search engine optimization. I got to catch myself because I know I I say SEO and people are like, what's SEO, especially in mm -hmm. the learning field. But I, I love that you're, you're looking at that. And I wanted to point out that if anyone's trying to figure out how to do this, and I'm sure, Paul, you could provide us some tips as well. We have a course on the TechSmith Academy called Brainstorming Video Ideas with a, a YouTube creator, Nick Nimmin. And, uh, but I think that's such an important thing is think about how people are going to look for your title. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Let's, let's talk about thumbnails for a second, Paul, because I, I, I know like I've been putting out the same thumbnails for the show, basically the same pattern. I don't know. That's the best. So I'm really, this is like, I'm, I'm here to learn Paul, what makes a good thumbnail on YouTube? And, and because I do think it's important. I think, you know, if someone's coming into a search engine or their LMS or whatever it is, and they don't have context, and they're just saying, I'm looking for something that's going to help answer my problem. Title and thumbnail are the first things I see. And so uh, what advice would you give us about making a really great thumbnail? Well, I think uh, a certain amount of consistency is important. Like, you know, sometimes um, um, you think about brands that suddenly change their logo or change their style. And, and uh, you know, you have to be very careful about that because when you change the look of something, uh, you could be losing a certain percentage of your audience. So I sort of have, um, you know, and anyone who takes a look at any of my, certainly my more recent videos on my YouTube channel, you'll see that I've sort of followed um, similar color conventions to the Adobe products that I'm talking about. I use the icons of the product. Um, I have my, you know, sort of down, uh, I guess you, instead of a, a like a lower third, you'd call it a, um, a left third, if you will, where I've got sort of a banner of the product and, and my own branding. And um, you'll see um, a picture of me, usually, uh, to the right-hand side of the screen. I have a bunch of those photos that I use over and over again. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm always adding new ones to it. And the, then there's some sort of background that contrasts it well. Um, I just pick those mostly for for appearance, for, for aesthetics. And uh, on top of that, then I have a very simple version of the title usually. So like if I'm talking about drag and drop, you might see the words drag and drop, even though the title might be longer. But I stick to that. I, I don't really change it too much because again, I want that recognition. Uh, if you were to do a search on Google or on YouTube for Adobe Captivate. Obviously, there's other people doing Adobe Captivate uh, videos, but mine are going to jump out at you. You're going to recognize my thumbnails right away. Uh, they're going to stand out from the rest. And I think, you know, when you look at some of the thumbnails on YouTube and look at it with that discerning eye, you know, what makes me want to click on this versus not click on something else? And uh, try to incorporate those things. That little green bar or the, um, it looks a little different on Matt's screen there, but the, the bar down the right side, I was actually influenced by Jamie Oliver. If you go to his YouTube channel, take a look at his uh, uh, clips. It's almost always a picture of him or the food that he's making. 
And then he has that banner down the side so that you know it's a Jamie Oliver video. You can't be confused with a, you know, um, Gordon Ramsay video. It's definitely a Jamie Oliver video. So I, th I think consistency is important, but it should kind of give you a sense of what the video is about as well. So uh, that's why I use words like drag and drop. Sometimes I'll even put a mini version of the slide that I'm building and and show that to uh to learners as well so you could build something that looks like this and again that that goes back to what we were saying earlier matt about appearances do matter right so yeah. if i'm showing you how to build a really cool interaction i want it to look amazing and therefore when i show it to you in the thumbnail it's going to look amazing there as well yeah it's really so uh you know i keep learning things about my software today but like i can see the green it's showing up gray on the screen here i'm just trying to zoom in there you can see it's gray here and it's obviously a little pixelated because i've zoomed into like 500 yep. percent. but yeah I, I actually looking at this paul i love i love the pop of color i love that the background has texture um and you know i i also love that like particularly in this one you're wearing your how to captivate shirt I yes. think that's, that's great, right? Like it makes, it's part of the persona and who you are. So this is, I mean, this is all really fantastic stuff. And I think it's such an overlooked and particularly again, internally, I think if you're on mm -hmm. trying to make money on YouTube or you're doing YouTube, you're thinking about thumbnails probably because that's a lot of the people who teach you how to do YouTube will talk about thumbnails, but I love what you're doing here in terms of, you know, you're, you're, it's still, each one is unique but it's clearly you as an expert. I, I actually really like the gray bar that, uh, or the green bar. It's gray in the, again, in our video for whatever reason, <laughs> but like I can see that there's the, the blue ones as well. So it stands out a little bit. And I think there's just a lot of, from my perspective, like, yeah, these look really great. And I, you know, it seems, hopefully it's, it's working well for you. It seems like it, it must be, you're doing, it doing seems well to me. Yeah. Channel. Yeah, I followed a like like you mentioned uh, Nick Nimmons before. I've I've followed his advice. He's got some um, some great uh, videos. He's more about not not so much teaching software like I am, mm -hmm. but teaching YouTube. And he's got some great videos, and and I definitely follow him as well. One of the tools that I use, and there's no plug here or anything, but um, I know Nick has mentioned it in some of his videos as well, is TubeBuddy. Yep. Um, they've got a series of um, browser-based tools that you can use to, to do some of these things like search engine optimization, A-B testing to see whether you know one thumbnail works over another. Um, I really recommend them. And again, they do not endorse me or anything like that. It's just a great tool. And even if you use the free plugin without paying for it, there's some really great benefits if you plan on being a YouTuber and, and want to sort of optimize those things. But one last thing I'll say yeah. about that is um, you know, for anyone who's stressed out about, oh, I got to worry about titles, I got to worry about designing thumbnails, I got to do this, I got to do that. Uh, we were talking before about uh, templates. All this stuff can be templated. So that, you know, once you've done it once, once you've built that template for your thumbnails, once you've built the, uh, the template using something like TubeBuddy to, you know, create your, um, your uh, suggested videos at the end of your videos, for example, it's, it becomes like a second that you spend, you know, selecting it and applying it to your video. It doesn't become a chore. Uh, templates are everything. I would even say that when, you know, using Adobe Captivate, you know, when you're building e-learning courses, same thing, you know, spend some time building the template so that you don't have to build 140 slides. You can build three or four master slides and use them over and over again. So yeah, love that advice. Great advice. Um, Paul, I, I want to say thank you at this point. We're, we're not done yet, but I want to, I think you've given us some really great advice and, you know, we're fans of TubeBuddy too. And I think there's so many, so many useful tools out there. You want to apply them. You want to use them, help your raise the bar for your, your, the quality of the stuff that you're making out there. If you're listening to this. Okay, Paul, we're, we're, we're going to jump ahead into our speed round questions. And so uh, speed round questions are meant to be quick, kind of uh, fast paced answer. It doesn't have to be one word or two word answers, but we're going to move through them pretty quickly. And Paul, we've changed it here. We used to just ask, questions. We have a list, a list of questions. We roll a die and we're going to see how this goes. So let's go into our speed round. Okay. 
Okay, so here we go. We're gonna we're gonna switch to uh, this is still our rough setup. We're gonna this is gonna look much better in about a year. I imagine as we go through <laughs> our but our dice cam. So got my dice roller here. Here we go with the first question, and it's just off screen a little bit. Oh, you get a you get a, a, a twelve. So here's what we're gonna because I don't have a twelfth question. I only have eleven written. So everyone can send me their twelfth question. So we'll just re-roll that one real quick. An eight, perfect. So Paul. If you had to pick an image that represented you, what it would what would it be? So you get to Google search the image that <laughs> represents Paul. What is it? Um, probably the Adobe Captivate icon, the, the very same icon you'd see when you're double clicking and starting that. Because if I'm known for one thing, it would definitely be that software. I love it. Makes perfect sense and on brand. So bonus points for that. Yes. <laughs> All right, our next speed round question. Ooh, a number one. And and if you've ever rolled uh, in dice in Dungeons and Dragons, normally a one is bad, but in this case, it's not. This is one of my favorite questions. <laughs> Paul, where where do you turn for inspiration as you're making your videos, as you're working through as an e-learning designer? What inspires you? Um, obviously, other e-learning designer developers. Uh, one of the great things that um, that being a part of this community has allowed me to, to enjoy is going to these conferences. So once you kind of become a little bit YouTube famous, uh, suddenly you're invited to different conferences. So I get to meet people like Matt, for example, or, you know, um, Josh, I'll just mention first names, Debbie, all these people who are like me in the e-learning industry who get together at these conferences and we go out uh, as Matt can attest to fantastic restaurants. And, uh, <laughs> yes. But share ideas like, you know, over over a fantastic meal, we can share ideas. This is what works for me. Hey, I tried this. This was awesome. So it, it's really great to be a part of uh, the, the, the greater learning community. Absolutely. And I, I'll, I'll just say that it's always inspiring to see what everybody's doing and and how gracious everyone is. And, you know, I'm. I don't try to hold my secrets. I don't have any, uh, but I'm just so impressed that it's never felt adversarial. It's always like, oh, what are you doing? How can I lift you? How can you lift me? Mm -hmm. Like it's, 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 I think one of the true benefits of being in, in the community is just that. Yeah, awesome. that's great. So, all right, let's do one more speed round question here. So bring up the dice cam. Here we go. Oh man, that, that lucky number 12 today. Ooh, seven. All right. I'm noticing a trend. I might have to change my die because it might be weighted to certain numbers, but seven. If you had to shift careers out of the world of making YouTube and Captivate type instructional materials, what would you do? You can do anything, but what would you do? Oh gosh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I th I think um, if I if I had to answer really quickly, I would say some form of consulting. Like if I couldn't make YouTube videos or Adobe Captivate eLearning anymore, I would probably want to move into some sort of consulting where I'm helping other people do those things. Uh, I still enjoy doing both those things, but um, you know, I know I would get great satisfaction of being able to pass on which is kind of what I do now, but be able to pass on my knowledge to, to other people as well so that they could benefit by it as well. That's awesome. And what, let's hope you keep uh, have a long time yet to keep making those yes. tutorial videos. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, Paul, one of the things we like to do at the very end is what we call our final take. This is a quick recap. What's what are the your what's your final take for us? What would you tell us about making YouTube videos, uh, tutorials and the like? Well, I think, yeah, it's really important. We, we really hammered these two points uh, in today's uh, talk. And that's, you know, uh, the spend some time on your thumbnails, spend some time on your, your titles, because that's going to contribute to uh, search engine optimization or SEO, SEO, as they say. And uh, that's going to give you the results. And don't be discouraged if you know the first couple of videos aren't so good i look back at my first few videos and you know i had a terrible microphone i didn't even have a webcam on some of those early ones and uh the quality of the video was like 15 frames per second so it looked really terrible you can build on that you can you can work towards that and uh you know after about 500 videos they start to look pretty good so uh stick to it don't give up 
And actually, that would be my final thought. I've seen so many people um, start this and then give up within three, four videos, and then they don't do any more. Stick to it. You know, don't worry about the fact that you don't have many views, you don't have many subscribers. If you consistently do this, it will come. I can promise you. That's awesome. I, I love that advice. Having good stick to itness, as they say. Yes. Uh, well, Paul, this is this has been an absolute delight to be able to talk with you and learn from you today. I've got a couple ideas of things. I'm like, okay, how how can I make this better in my own world? Uh, so I appreciate you spending some time with me. Uh, if anyone wanted to reach out and connect with you, they want to get Captivate training, e-learning design. They just are want to connect with you in any way. How how might they do that? Uh, two ways are probably best, either through my YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com slash Captivate Teacher, all one word, uh, you'll be able to connect with me there. In fact, uh, if you leave a comment in any of my videos, it doesn't even need to be related to that video, uh, a question or a thought or a suggestion. I'm still at the point where I'm not so large that I can't get back to everybody. And so far, I've been very good at responding to people. You can also find me at my website, captivateteacher.com. And from there, you can reach out to me about you know training, consulting, whatever it is that you need in the e-learning space. Awesome. And we will put those links in the show notes as well. So you can always just go and copy and paste and put those in your browser. Paul, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It's been fun. Absolutely. All right, everybody, as we wrap up today's show, thank you again for tuning in and listening. Hopefully you got some of those awesome nuggets that Paul was sharing. Hopefully you also stick with it. We like to say around here that, you know, make that first bad video, get it out of the way and then keep getting better and better. Of course, we always like to remind you that we'd love it if you would subscribe to our channel and to the podcast, because as you do, you get notified and you'll get great guests coming into your feed like Paul. So but as we like to end every show, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, we hope you take a little bit of time to level up every single day. Thanks, everybody.